All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Roseanne Bump. I'm Executive Director with FEI Twin Cities. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn this morning. It's great to see everybody. We have Cressa with us today, and they are going to be talking about some actionable items and some hot topics with real estate. So I'm going to turn it over to George Boyagis. George, it's all yours. All right. Thanks so much, Roseanne. You're welcome. We, we've got a really great group today. About uh, 28 folks have signed on, a wide variety of different uh, companies that they're representing, manufacturing distribution companies, uh, financial services, banking, not-for-profits, healthcare board members, retail, consumer packaged goods, and, and uh, my, my Cressa colleagues and, and presenters this morning. Uh, Sue, would you like to put up the, um, the, the slide deck for us? Can you see it? It's on its way. Okay, I can see it on my screen. Uh, are, are those of you on the uh, on the uh, program able to see it? Yep, I'm getting a few thumbs yes. up. Okay, and if you can't see the slide deck, don't worry about it because we will make the slide deck available to you afterwards. Um, so, uh, so that's another uh, uh, that'll be another resource in terms of following up. Uh, so, uh, we've got. Uh, three subject matter experts who, who are going to be presenting this morning. And, and then, um, you know, I'm going to be serving as moderator. So I'll be taking a look at the, uh, the questions as they come in. Uh, again, please feel free to, to chat. So if you'd uh, advance the slide, please. Love to George. <laughs> So uh, I think most of the people on, uh, on the call have, uh, I've, I've met you before. I'm going to be serving as your moderator. Uh, you know, I'm a CFO, CPA, four different companies here in the Twin Cities that I've been a CFO for, uh, a 26 year FEI member, 11 plus years with Cressa. So that, that's uh, me in a nutshell. And I've got the best job because I get to introduce my colleagues here and then uh, sit back and kind of watch, uh, watch the magic happen. Uh, Jim and Sue, uh, Jim, have, uh, Jim has 30 years of experience, uh, over 30 years of experience with Cressa. Sue has a little over 22 years of experience with Cressa. Uh, they both have tremendous experience in terms of strategic real estate planning, uh, working on a diverse mix of projects, office, industrial, medical, retail, everything from site selection to uh, real estate valuation issues, transaction management, management of national or global accounts, build the suits, development management, economic incentives, real estate tax, and the list goes on and on. So um, delightful to, to have their, their background and, uh, and experience with us. Nicole, um, we added her uh, late last week. We were looking at the agenda and said, you know, we really need Nicole in here as our subject matter expert uh, from a change management perspective. Um, Nicole is a member of the project management team. Nicole has about 11 years of experience with Cressa as well. And um, uh, as I mentioned, leads our change management practice, which is a significant portion of the, of the discussion today. Just to kind of level set things uh, before I turn it over to, to Jim, you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking about where we are at this moment. And, um, you know, I don't think there's any question. We're not going back to normal, right? We're going forward. I've heard someone say that we're going forward to a new abnormal. It's going to require extensive change management. Um, you know, this is not civilization's first pandemic, right? It's merely the first one that any of us have had a chance to live through. Um, so we're on this incredibly hard, incredibly difficult journey together to get to the other side. Um, and there's no question, life's not going to be the same afterwards, you know, when, when we get through this. We will be going forward to a new abnormal and, and the challenge is, you know, what does that really look like? But no matter what it looks like, those businesses that can learn, adapt, and change are going to prosper, while the others who don't learn, adapt, and change, they're going to have some really tough sledding ahead and, and may, not, may not be around. So I'm incredibly excited to be part of both FEI and CRESA because both of these organizations prosper by helping you learn, adapt, and change to this new abnormal, whatever that, that's going to look like. Our focus today is on real estate hot topics, actionable advice. As I mentioned, we're gonna help you learn, adapt, and change to the new emerging market realities. 
think about cost reductions, back to work strategies, and positioning companies for success, looking at this, this overall agenda. So uh, with that, I'll toss the baton to, to Jim to, to take us through. Thanks, George, and thanks for setting that up. Um, you can see the agenda here. We'll do a little bit of real estate market update first. Sue and I are gonna split that up. Um, I'll talk a little more of the local since I spend more time here and Sue is doing more national and international work. We'll let her bring that perspective. And then we'll get into some actionable strategies that we're either participating in or, or watching clients participate in. Uh, we'll touch on tax appeal. Um, and then we really wanna uh, use the bulk of the time to talk about return to work strategies and the change management around that. And that's, as George said, why we've um, asked Nicole to be a part of it. We thought we might do a quick poll question first. Um, so Roseanne, you might have to remind me how people vote, but we thought it'd be helpful for our perspective as well as for you who are listening in um, to let us know where your facilities are primarily located. So if you can just choose the button there that um, fits your portfolio, we'll make sure that we are um, addressing the right um, content and the, and the right material as, as we go through this today. Um, and as George mentioned earlier, and, and, and I hit the chat as well, um, happy to take questions at any time. Um, so don't feel like you have to save them to the back end, um, but um, we'll, we'll respond to those as best we can. Roseanne, how, how are the poll results looking at this point? Good, <laughs> sorry. <I'm> good. <laughs> <laughs> so I am sharing the results. There we go. Okay. Wonderful. That's great. Good. All right. Well, and I think that, um, so let me just talk locally first, and, and there won't be dramatic differences on the local versus national scale, but let me talk a little bit about what we know locally, and let me do that in three different channels. Um, first, let's talk about um, the retail market, and then we'll talk about the industrial market, and we'll come back to the office market. On the retail side locally, um, I think it's safe to say that uh, retail is in a free fall right now. Um, what seemed like headwinds in March um, turned into gale force winds in April and are now full on hurricane forces uh, going into the summer. We're watching, uh, many of you have obviously seen Neiman Marcus or J. Crew, or if you have teenage daughters, True Religion Jeans just filed bankruptcy. We have some major national brands that are in trouble. Even our own local Blue Stem brands um, has filed for bankruptcy in the midst of these. We don't know yet where bottom is for retail in terms of retail rents. And um, what we have seen is that retail landlords are reporting some really, really dire trends. Uh, one local landlord that I know told me that in April, they collected just under 50% of their rent, so just short of half. In May, he is hoping to collect 30% of his rent. Uh, this is a, an operator who owns primarily what we would call neighborhood centers. So smaller mom and pop operators, nail salons and flower shops and people like that. And most of those retailers simply don't carry the cash to continue paying rent or staff for an extended period of time without income. And so he is looking, you know, very anxiously at his rent rolls every day, wondering who's going to call next. Um, some tenants have called and just said, I can't pay the rent, sue me if you want. Other people have called and said, can I get a forbearance? Can we get some relief? We'll come back to that strategy in a little bit. Um, I can give you some statistics about what we're seeing around that. Um, and then I think on the restaurant side, as, as part of the retails, uh, most of you have probably seen the statistics that 30 to 50% of restaurants are unlikely to reopen. Um, when you think about a restaurant opening, they have to set up all the food inventory, new menus, train staff, do a soft opening and then go. That's short of building a new restaurant, all the costs of opening the first time they have to incur again. And few of them have the wherewithal to do that. So I think we're gonna see some major shakeout across that retail category. The industrial side is probably the exact opposite. And um, we're seeing it with some local activity. Sue can talk more at the national level about this, but industrial, looks like it's going to be the healthiest sector through this experience. Um, right now, you, there's still been 
tremendous interest in um, purchases. Some of you probably saw that Blackstone bought uh, Gary Holmes' CSM portfolio of industrial properties. That obviously closed just before the, the bottom fell out here. Um, a $650 million portfolio purchase of, of property. They bought it and have already been trying to raise rents 5 to 10% on industrial property in spite of what's going on. Um, we're, we're seeing a few proposals come in. The, uh, clearly, the landlords are favoring good credit, um, but we think industrial is going to stay strong. And I'll let Sue spend some more time on that. On the office side, um, we have two strong winds blowing that seem to be blowing against one another, and we're not clear yet how those shake out. First, there are companies saying, I don't need this much space. I figured out that I can home base a lot of employees, or I can get by with fewer employees, and I'm going to reduce my footprint. And I think that that trend is a fairly strong one that will play out over the next six to 12 months, maybe 18 months. At the same time, there are companies saying, I used to have four foot benches or six foot benches for my consultants who come in and, and go out. Those really small footprint spaces probably don't work in a post COVID world, even post vaccine. And so we're gonna be looking at people who want larger space per person, larger workstations, larger conference rooms, larger break rooms. So there's gonna be more demand per person, but maybe fewer people. And I just don't know how those two wins settle out. Again, I think that's a six, 12, 18 month um, trend. Sue, do you wanna, um, I, let me just hit this uh, slide really quickly too, and that'll maybe the transition to Sue's national perspective. Heinz, who's one of the big national landlords you might recognize in the office sector, uh, they did some research across their portfolio and looked at, um, you know, uh, specific industry sectors in, in different economies and started to project where they think rents will go city by city. They're the only people that have been bold enough to publish anything. Um, and this they published to their investors, uh, it was a little over a month ago that this came out. But their prediction is that Minneapolis office rents will drop 13%. That was the number they pegged, which puts us in the not surprisingly a tier that's similar to a Boston, um, Atlanta, Chicago, Denver. Um, there's some, some markets that maybe weren't as overheated or where they think the industries are gonna stay a little stronger and they won't see as much rent movement. You look at a city like um, San Jose or even San Francisco, you know, famously Twitter announced last week that work from home is a permanent policy if you want it. Well, Twitter's got how many thousand employees in the Bay Area they're going to take a lot of demand. All of the tech companies are going to take a lot of demand out of the market. And we're looking at rents that will drop 20 to 25% in some of those sectors. Sue, why don't I let you talk about what you're seeing across the country? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit at, uh, on a national level and a global level. Um, on a national level, on the industrial Side, developers, our large national developers, are now putting all their speculative, speculative developments on hold. Uh, industrial leasing activity has virtually stalled, except for High Bay Warehouse in, uh, in really good tra uh, traffic locations. So anything 28 feet and above clear. Uh, for e-commerce, uh, we've seen e-commerce absolutely explode. So you're the Amazons of the world are um, are going to do great through this whole period because everybody is ordering everything online. So that's probably on the industrial sector. The the one group that is going to do really well um, is that high bay warehouse in strategic locations. Um, new office transactions around the country that were not completed prior to the lockdown are now on hold or delayed. And a lot of that delay, as Jim was talking about, is how people are looking at using their office space differently. Um, I was just on the phone with a client this morning and they're talking about the only way they are going to go back to 100% occupancy of their office space is, is if there is either a, um, a way to, to make it better, to cure it, or a vaccine. That's the only way they will ever go back to 100% office use. Um, right now, they're looking at 30% office use later this summer. And then you, know, you have your social distancing and things like that, that they have to consider. 
Um, office and industrial renewal activities have also slowed. Um, early indications um, give us a downward pressure on rental rates. Um, concessions from the landlord, as Jim alluded to, there's a lot of people asking for deferred rent, uh, abated rent. Um, and then once again, the retail markets are in turmoil. Um, and the only, the only group that probably is not in turmoil, and we can all attest to this because we've gone to the grocery store, we've gone to Home Depot, um, some of your larger retail big box that have a grocery component to it are doing really well or, or if it's considered a, an essential service. Those retailers are going to do well and are doing well. Um, we do have one of our customers is a grocery store in the Twin City area and I asked him last week, um, how are your sales? And his sales since the lockdown in Minnesota have doubled, which is, you know, they weren't obviously weren't expecting that. So they are doing really well. They're having a hard time keeping everything in their grocery stores, but they're doing really well. On a global perspective, um, the APAC region and EMEA are having the same struggles um, with all of their markets as we are. EMEA right now is probably struggling further um, just because it's, uh, there isn't as much land area. People are congregated so closely together. That's how their culture is. And so there, the spread of coronavirus is really rampant through uh, the Europe, Middle East, and Africa right now. Um, so we actually see those folks kind of recovering out of this even later than the United States at this point. Uh, and the only, the only um, area where we're not seeing that, we actually have about um, six transactions that we're doing in China right now, and those landlords are not – they're holding their rental rates in terms. Um, they are not giving any indication that they haven't recovered completely from this. So um, you can take that for what it's worth, but that's what we're seeing. And so con contrast that, if you would, with, um, and I know you can't give out specifics, names, and those sorts of things, with the experience that you had with the one uh, great credit quality client in, uh, in Egan, in the industrial facility. I know we were talking about uh, recently um, so we have a client that we were looking for space in Egan um, in January, and every single space that we looked at was getting taken away from us a week later. It was just, it was crazy. We probably toured 10 different facilities and had five of them go away within six weeks, being leased out to other people. Um, we are still trying to do that transaction have narrowed it down to three and those brokers are calling me almost every day asking me when are we going to make a decision so their um their activity has dropped off significantly uh, but this uh, it isn't high bay warehouse it's just regular industrial space but as george points out it's a very strong economic credit tenant so the the landlords are especially hungry for stability and I think that is, you know, one of the trends that we'll see is that the healthier organizations probably swing a bigger hammer when it's time to renegotiate your lease. And, and that was something we really saw 2008, 2009, 2010, and that recovery credit was king. And, uh, and we're anticipating that that will be evident again as this year unfolds. I think. So let's talk about some of these expense reduction strategies. Um, we've got another poll question. Roseanne, can we pop that up? I'm curious how many people on the call um, have been looking at either rent deferral or rent abatement. And let me differentiate um, between those. Deferral is uh, where uh, we're seeing people ask the landlord, you know, can I pay you next year or can we add um, some term and, and get this paid back later? Whereas the abatement is obviously just a straight out free rent. Um, we've got a couple of clients negotiating with landlords saying, give me three months of rent abatement and I'll give you six more months of lease term at the back end of the deal. And uh, that, you know, I wouldn't say it's worked hundred percent, but it's opened the door in a way that says, Mr. Landlord, you've got an issue. I, I realize you need to pay too let me give you more value by giving you six months in lieu of three. Um, 
you know, if you've got only a year or two left on the lease, that's a pretty nice return for the landlord because it gives them a little more stability. If you've got 10 years left on your lease, um, you know, that you're not giving the landlord much. Um, so it, it depends a little bit on what you've got for remaining term. Interesting. So some of you have reached out for deferrals or abatements. Um, the Business Journal released a study this morning, actually, it'll probably be in their headlines today, where they indicated that some 80 plus percent of the landlords that responded to their survey had been approached and had granted some form of rent relief, whether it's deferral or abatement uh, to their tenants. So we know that this is happening. One of the landlords I know locally, um, we were in a chat about this a couple of weeks ago, and, and he said that you know, they categorize the requests in one of three buckets. He said, first, if we know it's a small business and we can see that they're affected by COVID, we're gonna be responsive and help them out because that's the right thing to do. He said, there are other people who are maybe in trouble and maybe don't need our help yet. So we're trying to make sure that they've applied for PPP or CARES or whatever other programs are out there. And then we're saying, call us when those dollars run out and let's see what we need to do. And I think that's a wait and see depending on, you know, how quickly the things recover. The third bucket is the people who are calling with their hand out, even though they don't need help. They're just doing it because they can. Maybe it's the basketball team that got the PPP loan that didn't really need the money. Um, maybe or maybe not. But, but his point was, you know, if they don't need the money, but they think everybody else is getting some, so they want theirs too. He said, A, they're not getting relief, and B, I have a very long memory. When it's time to renew their lease, I'm going to remember that they expected something for nothing. Um, so it was a reminder to us that if you need help, most landlords probably want to be supportive and work with you. And if you're just asking just to ask, it probably isn't a good strategy. Um, so we've been chatting with clients you know, extensively about what are the other resources, what does your cash flow look like, Many landlords are asking for current financial statements, you know, actual revenue numbers from the last 60 days versus last year. So when you do go in for those rent relief conversations, you're going to be asked to provide a lot of documentation. If you did the PPP loan, maybe you have all of that in hand and it's easy, but just know that those conversations seem to be, um, you know, well received if it's appropriate. So again, if you're a, a retailer who's really struggling, I think you're going to find um, a better chance if you're uh, you know a typical law firm and you're still billing clients and your landlord needs to get paid too because they've got their lender to pay and the lender's got investors to pay and it's a series of dominoes and so um, rent relief might help you but it costs a lot of other people and so we just want to be thoughtful about how we're encouraging folks to go after that but it is happening um, frequently and lenders and landlords know it's coming so if if you've got a legitimate case for sure, I would say go for it and, uh, and give us a call if you have specific questions. All so right, and to I'm going to go right, yeah, I'll go right into um, credit for operating expense reduction. So obviously there's a lot of spaces out there that have gone dark. Um, so we have a reduction in electrical cleaning, um, specifically if you're in an office, a multi-tenant office building. Um, and you get a uh, operating expense monthly bill, um, you really need to take note that those operating expenses are probably going to be lower this year. And maybe the landlord can look at that sooner rather than later to give you some relief um, in the coming months um, on those operating expenses, especially if you're gonna delay having your folks go back. Um, so that's an area where you can uh, really look at um, how you're using this space, how you're paying for the space. Um, appeal property tax values. So obviously Jim and I have been talking at length about the number of um, commercial office buildings and industrial buildings and retail buildings that are gonna decline in value. Um, the assessors know it. Um, it really is a good time to look at those values and see and predict, you know, in the future we can do an appeal uh, especially of the value for the, in Minnesota, since I know a lot of you have facilities in Minnesota, the um, January 2nd, 2020 value, if you have any indication that that value might be a little high, um, I would absolutely look at 
can we appeal that property tax, those property tax and get those to the lowest taxes for you. That's not an immediate expense reduction. That's something that's going to take a year or two to do, but it's definitely something that you should look at. And Sue, so there's a timing element for that here in Minnesota, right? I mean, it, it used to be that the real estate tax appeal deadline was the end of April, but they pushed that out to the end of this month, right? That's correct. Yep. Yep, you have until the end of this month to, um, uh, that's to appeal the January 2nd, 2019 value, which the market was very healthy then. Um, the appeal deadline to appeal the January 2nd, 2020 value is April 30th of 2021. Got it. On the business interruption insurance, this question has come up a couple times. Um, and, and oddly enough, landlords have been asking me, do your clients have BI coverage and does it cover something like this? It's one of the things that the landlords are wondering, can the tenant go somewhere else for relief? And not surprisingly, it's very much case by case. It depends on how your policy was written. Um, but again, I think if, if you're going to go to the landlord and look for relief, the landlord appropriately is going to say, who else can you turn to? And if you've tested your BI coverage, if you've tested the government programs, then the landlords are going to be a little more receptive. They don't want to be the only one um, giving you a hand. But the business interruption has been a very spotty, very case by case um, question and I think it's it's worth looking into if you haven't yet to at least test that to call your agents and find out, you know, is the pandemic named? Probably not, but what constitutes a disruption? If you're a retailer and the mall's been shut down, you know, I think you have a, a legitimate claim. But then the question is just whether or not your policy covers you. On the office side or industrial side, we're not seeing most buildings closed down, right? The buildings tend to stay open because there's essential workers there. And you have a different position, I think, if your building remains available, um, even if you've chosen to close your own offices. Um, but again, it's, it's worth digging into. And um, as we were drafting the content for this, we were thinking about PVP loans and care loans. I realized that every time I look at my computer, there's another article giving people guidance on what's deductible and what's not. And the IRS has now come out and said that expenses that you pay for with your PPP loan may not be deductible because that would be a double dip. Um, I'm not going to offer tax advice. You are all better um, financial folks than I am and, and have access to better advisors than we should be on that. So I'll let you uh, trust those resources. One, one quick point on that. FEI National um, is actually advocating. Uh, we joined with the AICPA and a bunch of other trade associations serving business to try and get that uh, tax uh, deductibility as part of uh, uh, part of it restored because it was passed in the legislation, but not issued in the regulations. So uh, FEI is working on that on behalf of our members. Well, I'm glad to know and exactly the right kind of people to be partnering with on that. Yeah. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So let's shift to this um, work from home and return to work. And I really want to give Nicole um, some time here, but let me just cover a couple of statistics that might be helpful. We have been jokingly calling this the world's largest work from home experience or experiment ever. Um, you know, I think a lot of us thought we had the capacity to work from home, but we never tested it. Now we have tested it in profound ways. And I think we're getting better at some things and we're figuring out what doesn't work. And um, so it's, uh, it's, it's been, at least for me personally, a <laughs> really interesting experiment. I was able to work for a really long time from the cabin but I can't possibly tour a building from Grand Marais. So I need to be back in the office and at least physically present. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm learning what I can do differently. As we look at some of these statistics, you know, collaboration and the social environment and the energy of being together are what people miss the most. And that's probably not surprising. I certainly miss that. I miss being in the Skyway and just walking by hundreds of people every day. Um, I'm enough of an extrovert to be in this kind of a business where we get to be with lots of people all the time. Um, I, I realize I miss that. Um, and I also miss some connectivity. I just, the people that I interact with regularly are more distant. And so you don't have those extra five minutes casually to visit with folks. And I think that is a, is a cultural loss we're gonna have to struggle with. Um, and I think on that culture side, you know, we're seeing it within Cross. I'd be interested to hear what stories you guys have just about how you're staying socially engaged and how you're keeping the team together. 
we were doing weekly calls. Um, we've now also set up small group weekly coffee meetings. So three, four, five of us find a time during the week to just take a half an hour and catch up on non-work stuff. Um, I think we all did a million Zoom happy hours at first. Those seem to be dissipating a little bit. And I think what I miss in a real happy hour versus the Zoom happy hour is that every once in a while when it's a real happy hour, you turn to one of the people and have a quick five minute side conversation. You can't do that in Zoom. And so I think the really personal stuff gets lost. Um, it's helpful to see the eyes of the larger group, but I, I miss those personal touches. Um, you know, we've heard stories about team competitions going on and exercise sessions. Um, when I was working from the cabin, I actually gave a few people one day a tour of the cabin. It's just like, this is where I'm working from. Where are you working from? Um, so we're trying to find ways to do that. And I think those are, are examples of um, ways that we're going to try to preserve the culture. But I, as George said, we're going into a new abnormal. It's, it's a different world. There's, there's no going back. And uh, so we've got to wonder about how we fill those cultural voids um, if, if indeed the office is not, the office tomorrow is not the office of the good old days, you know, back in January. Um, productivity, most people would say that they um, are either more productive or aren't, you know, appreciably different. The, the reductions in productivity are um, reported, at least anecdotally, from people who do more collaborative and creative work, people who are sort of inspired by the energy of other people around them. You go to an ad agency or the architects that I know um, would all say, I'm fueled by other people that I interact with. And when I heads down, I might get more drawing down. I'm way less creative. And um, so there's, a, I think, just a little bit of a, a gap in some productivity. But on balance, folks are, you know, are doing better. Um, what I thought was really interesting in this statistic, and this is some research that Cress has done, um, you know, 35% of the people, a third, are still working eight to five. Um, most of us have blurred the edges of our workday tremendously. I also think that a lot of people have been adding in weekend work time and saying, when there's work to do, I'll get it done. And when there's not, I'm going to take the dog for a walk or whatever. Um, so this, this flexible work thing has really shifted, I think, a bunch. Um, so, Nicole, why don't we let you talk a little bit more about um, work from home and we'll transition with this polling question. Has your work from home experience impacted your productivity? Are you more or less productive? And while people are thinking about that, you know, I, I just kind of weigh in on a point that uh, uh, I, I think it really depends on who the individual is and what their work from home situation is like. Uh, you know, uh, Jim, you and I have got, uh, uh, are fortunate that we're, we're past the the kid raising stage, right? And so we're able to kind of move most of the time that we're um, working from home. But there's a heck of a lot of us, colleagues and others, who, who are now for, forced into uh, the childcare process as, as well as, uh, you know, working at the same time, which has got to be a real challenge for folks that are in that situation. Interesting results here. A little less productive. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Nicole, so if we all want to get back to work, what do we need to do to make it work? Because it's really going to be exactly like it was in December, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, Jim. So before we dive into re-entry strategies for the workplace, I just wanted to point out a few interesting facts um, that we pulled from a Cornet global uh, survey that was conducted in uh, early April, which for those of you who may not be familiar with Cornet, it's the Global Association for Corporate Real Estate. Um, so 84% of respondents uh, said that they're planning a phased return to workplace. And we'll take talk a little bit more about what that looks like here in a bit. 78% uh, are looking to the CDC for guidance on re-entry timelines. 49% uh, state that remote work will remain an option, but based on conversations I'm having, I would predict that number is higher today than it was uh, when the survey was conducted. And then 66% have a more positive view of remote work. And I think a lot of that is middle management in particular, um, realizing they don't need to see people to know that they're working. Uh, the output of what the employees are providing is, is showing them that they're, they're being productive. 
So uh, the number one thing that employers should be doing as they prepare for this re-entry is creating optionality. Early on when the virus first started, someone said to me, we're all in the same boat. Uh, but the reality of it is we're not. We are all navigating the same sea, but we're in different boats. Some employees are challenged with working from home with kids. I'm one of them. Uh, who are out of school or daycare with no end date in sight. Others have pulled their parents from senior living facilities um, out of extreme caution. We have a population of workers who um, may have health challenges themselves that they have a lot of angst about returning and, and what their exposure could be. And then there's a group who don't really have, you know, any external factors weighing them down, so to speak. And maybe they're ready and more willing to return sooner than, than others. So, you know, employees, employers really need to be flexible um, and, and organizations can provide that with um, phased re-entry, ability to work remote and, and possibly a blended solution. Um, so we'll take a look at, at what that looks like. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to provide a little perspective on how vastly different every organization uh, approach and timing of re-entry is. Um, because the big question is, when will we see re-entry? There isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. Some organizations don't plan to start re-entry until 30 days after stay-at-home orders are lifted. Um, many clients I'm talking to are thinking June sometime. However, most don't have a definitive date. Um, and I'm working with a Fortune 500 company right now that is planning a very slow re-entry, 20% in June, 20% in July. But with that are restrictions on group meetings, which they won't be allowed to have until August. So that means Sally and John may both be in the office, but they're not meeting in a conference room. They're still doing their Zoom or whatever their technology platform is for their meeting. Uh, so much like all of us, you know, they don't know what a full return is going to look like. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they've implemented temp checks and a medical survey for each and every person that comes in and out of their facilities on a daily basis. Um, and you know, they're not the only organization, you know, we're all struggling with this, um, just in, in different capacities. I was talking to a friend who's a facility manager of another large organization and they don't plan to bring their employees back until all of their buildings are outfitted with infrared temperature cameras. Based on the quantity that they need, that's currently backlogged until July, which means they probably won't be returning until August. So uh, that's just a little bit of, about what um, we're, we're seeing out there. Uh, but inevitably, the return will have to happen. So with that, uh, let's transition to how you can ensure your employees feel engaged, productive, and healthy about their return to work. <clears throat> so we're going to take a look at how you can reduce density, increase sanitization, uh, and lastly, the one of the more important steps is ensuring your organization has a solid uh, change management and communication plan to facilitate the transition. Clients are asking us every day, what can we do to reduce density to create social distance in the workplace? And obviously the preference is to do so without having to do an expensive furniture overhaul. And <clears throat> so, uh, you know, one of, one of the ways, and we have two samples shown here, uh, is uh, phased re-entry where it's based on essential, most essential to non-essential. Uh, and even that is kind of vague. People are trying to, uh, I mean, how do you categorize that? I think it's kind of a blurred line. Uh, and then the other one is shift work. So you can see that week one, group A is there Monday through Wednesday, group B is there Thursday through Friday, and then they flip flop. So organizations are just really needing to rethink what modifications are needed before the employees uh, come back. And that'll include one way uh, walking routes, signage for shared spaces, having their protocols posted. Uh, for organizations who may have unassigned seating or touchdown space, they need to come up with a plan to limit sharing of technology devices. So what does that look like? If employees are 
utilizing a blended solution? Does that mean um, they're transporting monitors back and forth between their home and office? Is IT providing monitors in the office for those that come in that'll be sanitized each night and redistributed uh, the next day to the contingent employees that come in? So, you know, a, a, lot, uh, a lot to chew on there um, to come up with a, a good solution. And as we think about how, you know, we can reduce exposure, um, here's an example of what's considered safe versus not, you know, seating every other, eliminating uh, the use of conference rooms, eliminating group meetings in offices, not sharing an office. Every organization is going to be different. Uh, and I have some other examples that show uh, more detailed uh, shift in route planning, which I'd be happy to send as a follow-up uh, to this uh, to you via email that I think would be helpful. So as we look uh, at sanitization, um, first and foremost, it's not just going to be about the cleaning protocol that your landlord and office put in place. The design and furniture industries are predicting and planning for a shift in the finishes that are specified uh, in corporate spaces. Uh, that's a lot closer to healthcare grade furniture and fabrics, which are easier to clean and they have antimicrobial finishes. Uh, landlords are uh, swamped right now evaluating no touch technologies such as automatic doors, hands free toilet flushers, toilet paper dispensers, uh, even voice activated devices are being considered. Uh, I was on a webinar yesterday where landlord shared they're removing the common area seating to minimize the possibility that congregation happens. So for those of you that um, are in a multi-tenanted building, those common areas are, are going to look different when you return. Uh, many organizations have in recent years gone to um, common area trash and recycling. Now we're hearing maybe individual uh, trash and recycling at the desk will reduce uh, exposure. Uh, I predict that we'll see a lot of um, uh, self-cleaning uh, antimicrobial products in um, high traffic and public uh, points. Uh, employees are going to expect uh, sanitization uh, stations within your own office. Um, those may or may not include, include the expectation of complementary gloves, masks, and wipes, um, but at a minimum, uh, sanitization stations will be expected. And then lastly, uh, a lot of organizations are inquiring on what they can do to improve air filtration and reduce the contaminants. And this is a hot topic for those particularly in manufacturing, but it's certainly a concern with their office occupiers. And landlords are very much aware of this and most are responding accordingly to increase the air exchange. But if you have any questions or concerns about what or how your building is implementing sanitiz sanitization processes, um, I'd encourage you to reach out to them directly. I know many of them are still developing their protocol and some are also, you know, they have a developed protocol, but then they need to await building ownership approval before they can share those guidelines. Uh, which is part of the delay. And Nicole, some of these things are, the, uh, these changes are, are easy for the landlords or the occupiers of the building to implement. Others uh, require, you know, massive change depending upon, for example, uh, the amount of improvement to air filtration. Uh, you can turn dials with, it, uh, with respect to an existing uh, chiller system, HVAC system, that kind of a thing, but you can only turn the dial so far, right? So uh, some of these issues are going to require substantial reinvestment in order to accomplish the kinds of uh, uh, objectives that, that a lot of uh, employees are going to be looking for. Exactly. And, you know, I think we'll see a trickle of this uh, for those that are in uh, the market for new space and what we're seeing as part of the um, requirements in the lease language for what the buildings are providing. So we did have one question uh, pop up. We actually had two questions, one that relates to our last polling question, but um, 
Nicole, one of the questions that popped up uh, was uh, that uh, for, uh, the companies had difficulty getting sanitizing products such as wipes, antibacterial soap, hand sanitizer, as they prepare to get back to their offices. Uh, how do we, what, what thoughts do we have about local sources or additional sources for the products or solutions? Um, any thoughts on that? And then a, a second uh, question about antimicrobial furniture surfaces. How advanced really is that stuff? If, if you have the ability to comment on, on either one of those two uh, questions at this point. Sure. So as it relates to um, obtaining, uh, you know, sanitizing products, um, you know, the the large corporations uh, seem to that rely on um, on companies to provide that have a have a little bit of an upper hand uh, on it. One of our clients uh, at the beginning of or mid March. Uh, they had uh, just a couple of weeks of supply left. And, uh, you know, I think the bigger challenge is smaller offices, um, even like Cressa, where, you know, we don't have a service that provides that for us. We, you know, rely on Costco or Target to, you know, get our sanitizing products. And I think that's going to be, continue to be a, a challenge for businesses. Um, unfortunately, I'm not aware of any local sources for these products. But I, I feel like that'll be a hot topic um, as re-entry to, to work um, becomes more of a reality. I as do far know. as the, oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, as far as the antimicrobial furniture and surfaces, um, it's, it is advanced. Um, again, we're, what we'll see is um, architects specifying healthcare. Uh, grade products versus what has been uh, typically corporate products. So it's not something, some new technology necessarily. Sure. And I was going to uh, comment that if you're in the uh, healthcare space, uh, Medical Alley does have, uh, does have a, a matching service that they're using uh, to try and match suppliers with uh, with uh, uh, consumers of uh, you know business consumers for things like this, if you if you if you need uh, that sort of matching process, uh, I'm not aware that the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce or anyone else has come up with that that sort of matching capability. Uh, but I know that uh, that Medical Alley is is advancing that that idea. And I see uh, uh, <laughs> Marlon. Uh, thank you. Green Mill is selling one gallon and five gallon container containers of hand sanitizer. So there you go. <laughs> Great. Okay, so the last nugget of information that I really wanted to be sure to share with you today is about how you can steer your boat, um, the boat of your organization to have success with a re-entry plan. And, you know, that's, that's through change in communication management. Um, the pillars of good communication management include strong project sponsorship, uh, which involves leadership alignment, having a clear, consistent, accessible, and transparent communication plan that's available to your employees, uh, allowing employees to, uh, to become active participants in the process uh, will um, minimize the uncertainty uh, and kind of calm their angst uh, by sharing with them those new new uh, tools that you have. And their engagement and buy-in will certainly um, play a part in, in the success of the plan and, and make them feel empowered to make that transition back. And then lastly, after you know the new standards have been put in place, um, you'll wanna be doing 30, 60, and 90 day check-ins to be sh sure um, what you have in place is working, what challenges are employees facing, uh, what, what needs to be changed. So, you know, part of my job at Cressa, and I find it a privilege to have, have this be part of my job, is to work with organizations every day that, you know, rely on us to help them facilitate and execute change within their organization. And there isn't a one size fits all. And with absolute certainty, I can tell you that, there, that nobody is an expert uh, on what the solution will be right now for these unchartered waters we're in. So, you know, all we can do is 
utilize the information uh, available to us and, and have a strong change in communication plan that will set the foundation for your organization to re-enter um, as successfully as possible. And Nicole, you're so right. I mean, we're, we're fortunate to get to help people kind of figure out what's next for their organization. Um, so that kind of brings us to our last polling question here. When do you plan to bring your employees back to work? Um, Nicole, I know you mentioned a couple of companies that are doing staged um, re-entries. I saw that um, Amazon in their Minneapolis office has told employees that they can assume work from home is a permitted plan through October 2nd. And uh, their intent, I believe, was to say, look, we recognize that until your kids are back in school, you may not have a clear plan. So you can come back to the office sooner if you'd like, but don't assume that you're expected back until your kids are back in school and things normalize in the fall. So that was a really generous, you know, um, policy wow. statement to make this early. <clears throat> and I've heard of a few organizations, Jim, that are taking that approach. It's, you know, employers don't want to put the pressure on employees to feel like they have to return when uh, everyone's in a different situation. Yeah, I think recognizing that, you know, the physical health is one aspect, the emotional health is, is a equally valid concern. And if people are anxious about coming back to work, forcing them back into the office might not actually contribute much productivity. Um, but I also recognize, I mean, Elon Musk famously getting the Tesla plant back online and their employees saying, I don't feel safe going to work, but if I don't go to work, I lose my unemployment benefits. And so, I, you know, there's, there's a host of issues that, that go with this staged return. And, and then back to your point of it's the same storm for everybody, but we're all in very different boats. You need to look at your own workforce, your own work environment, the integral nature of any individual's work and how the team functions um, as you establish these plans. And I think, Nicole, you also made a really important point about kind of creating this team of people that works on it so that you've got HR talking to finance, talking to sales, that everybody is on the same page and you're thinking about all of the aspects of customer engagement and employee engagement. So just how you communicate internally and plan for all the moving parts is, is critical. I think going back gradually as opposed to hastily is, is the right way to do it. So interesting that, that in our survey there, people are either going back soon or we don't know yet. Um, and uh, that's probably true for Crest. I think we don't know the answer to that either. We normally try to finish these. Um, I know FEI likes to finish right at one o'clock. I know that Sue and Nicole and I and George would be happy to hang on and answer some questions. So um, let's throw it out. If you'd like to ask a question, unmute yourself and throw it out there or um, use the chat box. Yeah, and we certainly understand if you need to move on to your next meeting time. So of course. Um, you know, certainly do that, but feel free to stick around as well. So thank you everybody for coming. Yeah. All right, let's see what questions we had. Bye, Karen. One of the questions that was asked was, uh, you know, uh, regarding expectations for Governor Waltz's announcement about uh, the emergency declaration. Um, <laughs> what what are folks' thoughts about uh, how that might uh, uh, roll out here in in the next couple of hours? Anyone willing to make it? Six thirty tonight with with great certainty. At six thirty tonight, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, I mean, the, the, the media sources that are reporting on that right now are suggesting that the emergency orders will be extended another 30 to 45 days, but that the gradual reopening will also continue. So the stay at home may be stair-stepped, um, but the governor will try to keep control for a little bit longer. And I think that, you know, I, I, I probably like a lot of people, some mixed feelings about that. I think that the, the gradual reopening is is appropriate for a lot of reasons, but I recognize that if we're too quick, the uh, the healthcare consequence to that is really predictably profound, and so I don't want to be foolish. Um, on the other hand, I look around outstate Minnesota, and I recognize that there are a lot of resort communities that make, you know, 80% of their money in the next four months, and if they aren't allowed to open, those businesses die, and that's not good for us as a region. So, um, and I, I see both sides of this really clearly, and I, I'm glad it's not my job to make that call. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I really, really need a haircut, but I don't want to risk my life by getting it, right? You know, so it's, yeah. there, there's no good answers to this. Others, thoughts on that? Anybody else want to weigh in? 
it's been interesting to watch Iowa, um, their governor opened up 77 of their 99 counties because their occurrence in, uh, of the COVID-19 virus was so low in those areas and they're just focusing on the high, high uh, counties. So that might be a good way for walls to go as well as far as the Northern Minnesota, et cetera. Well, and no one has promised that you're, you're exempt from getting it. I mean, that's the issue right. in Grand Marais. Is everybody's like, well, we don't want to be the first patient. It's like, well, sure. frankly, I wish the first patient would come so that we can get cycled through the people. I mean, it's it's going to happen. Right. Um, so it's it's a question of what's the most efficient way to utilize the resources we have. Um, I think it's it's all resources. So that's personal opinion. I, yeah. And and what's the safest way to herd immunity, right? I mean, uh, when you have either a, a vaccine or you have a, an effective treatment protocol or you have herd immunity, right? That's that's when we're on the other side and looking at the new abnormal and looking at this situation in the rearview mirror. But uh, but the question is, how do you get there, right? Yeah. Nicole, can I ask you a question? You were talking yes. a little bit about the, as people rework their space, I mean, um, the, the cost of buying all new furniture because you're gonna go to eight by eight workstations instead of six by six. Um, I've heard a couple of people starting to ask about just putting up acrylic panels to raise the panel height. Are there some less expensive furniture solutions that people are looking at or that you've talked to architects about doing for any of our clients? Yeah, so I would say all of the furniture vendors have the ability to provide some sort of divider. Uh, you're still going to run into, I mean, for those organizations that, uh, you know, might have bench seating, um, for example, they're still going to probably have to alternate seats. Um, but for, for most, I'd say for a majority of, of our clients um, and uh, you know, outside of perhaps call centers, uh, just providing mm -hmm. some sort of barrier will be an inexpensive option or less expensive, I should say. And I, uh, I can jump in here. I was actually just talking to a client this morning um, and they have specific buildings that they are going to reoccupy and they have their facilities folks um, in there basically cordoning off the places that people can sit. And so when they bring back 30% of their workforce, it isn't going to be at their desk that they were at. It's going to be, you can sit in this desk on this day, and then at night it gets cleaned, and then somebody else may be sitting there the next day when it's not their day to be there. So they're actually just using physical signage and physical barriers to um, have people come into the office and work just to prevent anything from, from happening. And, and some of that is, you know, they fully admit some of that is a perceived, um, this will make you safe. And it really is up to the, um, they also went so far to say, um, everybody who comes into the building will wear masks. Everybody who comes in the building will have temperature checks. Um, they will have the ability to wear gloves um, and other PPE if they so choose. Um, it, it's pretty extensive what they're going through to try to bring people back to a, a specific area within their company, which as Nicole identified was most essential. So is there the sense that that's a post COVID protocol or even a post vaccine protocol? I mean, it seems to me that we're in this window where one of you was mentioning, you know, that, that until we have a cure or a vaccine, we're going to behave really differently. Are we going to shift to alternate day or alternate workstation or whatever. I mean, is, do you guys have the sense from the major employers you're working with that that's a, the new normal or is this sort of an interim step until we have cures and vaccines that we can rely upon? Well, um, what this client was saying this morning is they have a four phase um, return to work. The first phase is this 30% return to work in specific areas with uh, PPP, PPE available, um, temperature checks, uh, a lot of the things that they're going through to get those people into the building and working. Then they're going to go on a wait and see how is this working. And as we move through our, our storm journey 
then the next phase would be bringing another 30% back. And, you know, what that looks like, they don't know today. They don't know if it continues, everybody in the buildings continues to wear masks and gloves and, you know, sanitation and, you know, social distancing. They don't know. They, they have said the only way they go 100% back to work is if there's a vaccine or a treatment plan that actually works. Right. And I would reinforce too that, you know, for the organizations that I've spoken with that, that are planning maybe a 20% in June and 20% in July, uh, they're still encouraging people to work from home if they're able to. But they, you know, we need to start a slow re-entry at some point. And so, um, you know, how they determine which, you know, what, which individuals will return, uh, whether that's, you know, essential, is it voluntary, um, I think is to be determined. Uh, and for the, the one company that I referenced um, in their approach, I mean, they don't have a, a plan of what a full return would look like right now. Their plan is how could we get 40% of our workforce occupied in our buildings, um, you know, by, by end of July. Yeah. You know, we're, we're at uh, around uh, one Oh eight here and uh, we could keep this conversation going obviously uh, for quite a bit. Um, but we do want to be respectful and give folks the, the opportunity to drop off if they would like to, there was one, maybe one more question that was posed to, uh, to the audience. Um, are, are, are we hearing concerns from tenants about going back to work, given that some other economies around the globe are shutting down either partially or fully again, whether you're talking about Lebanon or South Korea, Wuhan, China, and, and some others. And so the, the question really is, what are we hearing as, as a result of um, our finger on the pulse of what tenants are doing these days? So from my perspective, uh, I think people are uh, kind of planning for the worst, so fully expecting that we could have another wave similar to what we were going through now with a re-entry again. Yeah, Sue, are you, with your international clients, are you hearing any um, reactions or any different behaviors as a result of say South Korea closing down again or Wuhan? Um, we actually are doing two lease transactions in Wuhan right now and they uh, released or they went out of lockdown about three weeks ago and in that culture everybody it, you know they went through SARS as well um, so everybody wears masks and it's really hard to get information out of Wuhan on what is really going on I can tell you that a lot of people um, in that culture feel like they need to go into the office to work. So there are a lot of people that go into the office to work. Uh, with this particular client, they don't actually need to go into the work. In fact, um, the client requested that unless the employees absolutely had to go into work, uh, for, for example, for manufacturing, that they not, that they continue to work from home. Um, so I would tell you in Wuhan, they are back to work, they are working. In Singapore, they also released them to go back to work, and they immediately had a relapse. And so now they're um, now they're staying at home again. So it, I I think it just depends on when they release people and how bad it was. Did they really know how bad it was? Um, those both those you know specifically Singapore. I mean, those people are packed in there, so it doesn't surprise me that they had a big splurge again and, and had to go on lockdown. So um, I just think we're, there's so many unknowns, even for today's meeting today, we were changing slides yesterday. Um, and we had this whole thing planned last week. And it, it just, it, it, everything is changing so much every single day with the information that we're getting. You, you know, the, the one thing that I see is a constant across all of it. There are a few things that are constant, right? But the one thing that I see as a constant is everything is taking longer to do, right? I mean, the whole process of, 
you know, we, we would typically advise our clients about when to start a lease renewal or something like that. And it seems like everything is taking longer to, to, uh, to, to work through the various processes, uh, whether it's, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, departments, uh, governmental agencies that are shut down. And so you can't get permits pulled and, and those sorts of things, or whether it's conversations uh, for touring facilities or things like that, that there's a brand new normal for how that gets done. It seems to me that everything seems to be taking longer. Jim, Sue, are, is that what you're seeing as well? Yeah, I mean, so yes, far. I think, I think it's, it, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's more of nobody knows what the new normal for their spaces is going to look like. And so everybody, instead of, unless they absolutely have to do something, they are taking a step back and reevaluating it. And even if they reevaluate it today, the answer may be different four weeks from now. Mm -hmm. Very good. I can, you know, share that on the construction front, uh, you know, in Latin America, uh, most of the countries, uh, contractors, uh, aren't designated as essential like they are here, uh, but they are slowly opening up to them, but they then need to go through an approval process and it's so backlogged, it can take a month to hear back from the government. And at that point, the contractor then has to provide their um, permit that the government issued to them uh, for the building to approve the giving them access to the space. Um, so that's you know a challenge we're seeing um, in Latin America and locally, um, locally nationally I should say, uh, you know we're we're going to run into issues on the furniture manufacturing side with the backlog there. Very good. Well, hey, on on behalf of all of us at Cressa, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to to share some of our thoughts. Uh, Jim, Sue, Nicole, uh, it's a tremendous privilege working with you and, and being able to, to uh, get your expertise as, as, as part of the commentary today. So um, uh, again, thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Roseanne for her wrap up and maybe a conversation about uh, what we have coming up next in FEI. Perfect. So um, thank you everybody for being here. We are going to send out the slides and contact information for all of our speakers. So if you do have additional questions, please feel free to reach out to them. We do have some additional programming. Uh, the next, actually the next several Wednesdays are all lined up with programming. So I hope you will uh, take a look at what's coming up. I'll include that out to the link uh, out in the email with you and a quick survey. So thank you everybody. It's great to see everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.